You can't rely on wishful thinking. You have to consider the worst case scenario. They say that within 72 hours, they can reach Lviv. And if you look at the map, it's pretty much open bar. Thankfully, NATO has a plan. So I'm going to go through it with you. And this seems to be a document from the multinational division of NATO. Hi, and welcome to History Legends. Here's the latest update about the Russo-Ukrainian war. If you have any new updates or information, just comment it below. This is the place where we cut the BS and where you learn what's actually going on. If you like the information I provide and want to support my work, you can help me on Patreon. The link is in the description. I actually want to jump right in, but there's a little thing I want to mention before. Now, before I show you the Belarusian plan to invade Western Ukraine. Wait, hold on. How do you pronounce this? Belarusian? Belarusian? Belarusian. Belarusian. I have to tell you why Western Ukraine is important in the first place. Today, we'll talk logistics. Did you know that an army division of the US Army needs 600,000 gallons of fuel a day? More than twice that was consumed by Patton's entire army. And since everything is motorized these days, you can imagine how much fuel is necessary both for the Russian and the Ukrainian armies. Now, of course, you need fuel for tanks, armored vehicles and whatnot. But you might not know this, but you also need fuel for the trucks that bring fuel to the tanks or various supplies to the troops. And then you have to secure the roads that you use to supply your men. This is the problem of Russian units in northeast Ukraine. Although they reach Kyiv quickly, the Russians achieved this by leaving a lot of Ukrainian garrisons behind. This move also caused their lines of communications with Russia to be stretched out. And these roads are constantly harassed by highly mobile local guerrillas, which cause high losses in highly valuable logistical equipment. However, the fact that these local Ukrainian units are spread out and far from supply bases also caused them to have logistical issues. I found this map online that shows the four main roads used by the Ukrainian armed forces to supply their troops in Donbass. They're marked A, B, C, D. Currently, A and D are the most threatened by the Russians. The Ukrainians have sent a lot of reinforcements along the front line of A and D. But currently, the bulk of their logistical hub in the region has to go through Pavlorad. So this might be the next Russian objective. Now, according to the Times, the Ukrainian army is running out of ammunition. And that is very critical if you want Ukraine to stay in the war. And this can be particularly seen with second rate units like the territorial defense. This is something I've heard, but I can't show you exactly. But for example, for the territorial defense, some units of 50 men only had 12 AKs and 200 rounds for all of them. For now, the West has mostly sent weapons that help the Ukrainians destroy Russian armored vehicles, since these are at the center of the Russian military doctrine on a tactical level. For example, Britain will supply Ukraine with 6,000 anti-tank missiles and high explosive fragmentation systems. And Sweden announced that it will send a second batch of 5,000 anti-tank 84 weapons. And that makes a total of 16,084 sent by various European countries to stop the Russian invasion. And that's not all. The US is also preparing to send a second batch of weapons. According to the White House, the second batch consists of 800 Stinger anti-aircraft systems, 2,000 Javelin, 1,000 light anti-armor weapons, and 6,084 anti-armor systems, 100 tactical unmanned aerial systems, 100 grenade launchers, 5,000 rifles, very important, 1,000 pistols, 400 machine guns, and 400 shotguns. Of course, they're Americans, they're gonna send shotguns. But also 25,000 sets of body armor and 25,000 helmets. And over 20 million rounds of small arms ammunition and grenade launcher and mortar rounds. Now, 20 million rounds looks crazy. Million. But considering the Ukrainians have currently about 600,000 men on the front line, that's 33 rounds per man. 33. That's one full mag of ammo of an AK. That's about what? 10 minutes of battle? If you hold your trigger. Now let's imagine the Ukrainians have 300,000 men on the line. We stand at 60 rounds per man. Two mags. So again, I think that the bulk of this ammo will be handed to professional soldiers. And once again, territorial defense will have to suffer from a lack of ammunition. Now the White House said they already sent 40 million rounds of ammo and 1 million grenade, mortar, and artillery rounds. Artillery rounds is another thing that gets used 
pretty fast in real war. For example, at Kharkiv, the Russians fired in one minute more artillery rounds than the French fired in one year of training. And don't quote me on this, but I think the French military used up most of its high precision artillery rounds during its mission in Mosul. And some people say that they have enough artillery rounds for one day of battle. One day. That's just to show you how much ammunition is important and how fast it gets used up in a high intensity conflict. Now let's move on to Western Ukraine. Now if we look at a map of Eastern Europe, we can see that NATO weapon deliveries can come through Poland, Slovakia, Hungary and Romania. Now Hungary is not too keen on letting NATO weapons pass through its territory. But anyway, the Carpathian regions beyond Slovakia and Hungary has a lot of mountains and it's not transit friendly. But now you have Romania. Part of it is linked with Odessa, which is good. But the only real viable route to supply all Ukraine has to go through Yash. But it's a huge detour coming from Western Europe. And again, it has to go through Hungary, so not great. So the bulk of the help can only come from Poland. Now the main NATO logistical hub for Ukraine is located in a city called Rezhuv. This is where most of the equipment is regrouped. Now sending equipment to Poland is not as easy as we might think because most of the roads and train stations are clogged up with refugees. So it kind of slows down the entire process of weapons delivery. And as you can see, all this material has to transit through Western Ukraine. Now the main Ukrainian logistical hub is right in front of the Polish border at Lviv. And from there, everything gets redistributed. However, it has been noted that a lot of these weapons have a hard time actually reaching the combat units on the front line, especially those in Eastern Ukraine. Now the Russians can clearly see these convoys of weapons, but why are they not targeting them? The first reason is that Ukrainians formed highly defended truck convoys to deter Russian airstrikes. A significant amount of these deliveries are done using civilian trucks and cars. Since a lot of logistical equipment of the Ukrainian armed forces has been destroyed or damaged. Now imagine in a parallel universe, nothing to do with the current conflict. That some people use, for example, a school bus to stack grenade launchers, rifles, javelins, you name it. Now, if an enemy decides to destroy that bus, now 100% the media will say how evil they are because they destroyed a school bus. So the idea for the Russians was to simply cut the logistical route at the hub, at the root of the system. And this is where we have to talk about the Belarusian intervention. Lately, a lot of Belarusian vehicles have been marked with a red square and they've been gathering towards the Polish-Ukrainian border. And basically, this explains the growing fears of Western officials of a Belarusian intervention along the Polish border to cut weapon deliveries. And thing is, Lukashenko, the president-elect of Belarus, kind of owes Putin. And to make matters even worse, a lot of Ukrainian reserves that were stationed in Western Ukraine to prevent such an attack have since been redeployed to Eastern Ukraine and Kyiv. And if you look at the map, it's pretty much open bar. Thankfully, NATO has a plan. NATO has prepared a contingency plan if that was to happen. So I'm gonna go through it with you and this seems to be a document from the multinational division of NATO. So here you can see our AOI, our area of interest, basically the Polish-Ukraine border, an area of 140 and 120 kilometers. What's interesting is that there's multiple cities in this area, the biggest ones being Lutsk and of course Lviv. Now the population here is 3.5 million but with all the refugees it might be much higher now. Okay now they have a weather forecast. Okay September 2019. Hold on. <laughs> okay they prepared this plan in September 2019. That's actually nuts. Okay, now is one of the most interesting parts is the terrain feature. It says in the north, right at the Belarusian border, you have soggy soil and wetland. And there's a river that separates the two countries. And there's wooden areas in the north as well. So this might have a huge impact if the Belarusian troops want to attack. Like it says, dense wooden areas will slow mechanized troops movement. Lots of small rivers and channels have negative impact on movement. Okay, now we see the three ways that the Belarusian troops could attack from. But what's interesting is that here you have the city of Kovel, if I see it properly. That means that they assume that Belarusian troops 
will be able to take over all that area without much trouble. Although I'm not sure if this assumption still holds in 2022 as we've seen in a lot of the previous battles. But basically you have three axes of operation. Then here you have K's everywhere and it's road junctions or bridges. So we can see that the western part has a lot of these rivers of bridges. It's going to be a complicated push, whereas the eastern end is a bit more open ground. So once again here they describe the landscape, forest, open, swampy, wetlands. And here it says effects on our course of action. Open lowlands, favorable conditions for observation and direct fire. They probably think of Russian vehicles, Russian tanks. Whereas urban terrain and forest areas make observation limited. And these places are also good for ambush. They continue by saying that dense forests provide good cover and concealment for enemy units. Okay, I skipped a few ones because the military organization of the troops that could be used in this operation has changed a lot since because of the Ukraine intervention. Again, here it says from Kovel, what course of action could Belarusian Russian troops use? And now it, it's interesting. They say that within 72 hours, they can reach Lviv. But we know that with the current state of the Ukraine army, it's not going to be that easy. So you see, it's one main strike from the center area. And you remember the western side here has a lot of villages, bridges, so they might avoid it and simply use the central flatland and which is interesting is you have a second course of action you still have that central push but you have a flanking maneuver by securing the big city of Lutsk which you don't want to keep on your flank but of course this would reduce the thrust of the main grouping and now as for Ukraine defense most mechanized brigades the cream of the Ukrainian armed forces have been redeployed and what's interesting is that they've been redeployed to stop the Russian flanking maneuver south line D, and some more mechanized and armored units to counter the northern pincer, line A. Now, if we look at the latest updated deployment map of Ukraine forces in the west, we're left with mostly infantry brigades and various territorial defense units. Now, according to the latest battles, whenever the Russians face at least one brigade of infantry or whatever in a city, they can't take it. However, it still allows them to bypass this area. However, the moment you have three brigades, it creates a real problem for the Russians since they can't even bypass this area. So in the case of a Belarusian intervention, the best would be to withdraw some units, create some strong points with multiple brigades and halt the Russians and Belarusian troops. Again, in my opinion and from what we've seen. Now the Ukrainian general staff is prepared for such an intervention, but they said that they certainly don't need this extra pressure on the western end. Now, is it going to happen? Some claim that it will start once Mariupol falls and once the Russians launch phase two of their offensive. I personally think the Belarusian intervention seems a bit far-fetched. Because what makes a Belarusian intervention unlikely is the size of their ground forces estimated at 16,500, about three brigades. Not nearly enough to complete their objective. They would have to be supported by numerous Russian units when we know Russia already faces severe manpower shortages. Honestly, at this point, it only seems like a diversion to keep as many Ukrainian troops stuck in the West that will not be able to intervene elsewhere on the front. Because honestly, I feel it's too late. If they wanted to attack, they would have attacked immediately at the beginning. I also feel that the Belarusian army lacks combat experience. And since this attack will be one single thrust, very far from any neighboring Russian units, if shit hits the fan, they're on their own. And even then, the Russians are already struggling the logistics of coordinating multiple fronts. They can't envision supplying another front far away. Think about it. What's the infrastructure across Belarus? It's not that great. The Belarusian column might simply stop because of a lack of fuel and spare parts within a week. Now, I still think that the Russians have sent most of their reinforcements towards Kherson. And from there, it's quite clear that they can strike at the soft belly of the Ukrainian army with the capture of Kriviryr and pushing towards the Dnieper by capturing Kremenchuk. That way, you effectively cut off the main supply lines of 17 Ukrainian brigades. 
and this could be coupled by a Russian push south to complete the East Bank encirclement of Kiev. And everything leads to believe that the Russians have decided to finish off Chernihiv. They're currently fighting for the village of Slavutish, and according to various sources, they have blown up a couple bridges around Chernihiv, and they claim that it is a preparation for a siege. Anyway, these Russian maneuvers seem much more likely to me than the threat of a Belarusian offensive towards Vif. And I know it might sound a bit pessimistic, but it's a good approach to envision the worst case scenario and prepare for it. And I think this is the way the Ukraine general staff thinks. You can't rely on wishful thinking. You have to consider the worst case scenario. And there has been talks about a possible Polish intervention. Meanwhile, a Polish secret plan was leaked where they prepared to send 10,000 peacekeepers to Ukraine. And there has been a lot of footage, images showing that they were indeed telling their troops to get ready for operational duty. But today at the NATO summit, NATO basically said no, that it will not deploy any troops in Ukraine to avoid an escalation of the conflict with Russia, aka World War III nuclear oblivion. So that's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you enjoy my videos and get a lot of information from it, consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is in the description.